Uh, we're going to move into the valedictory session. Chairing this session, uh, I'd like to uh, invite on stage Mr. Samir Yagnik, the Summit Chair and Executive Director, Electra EV. A brief introduction. With over 30 years of experience in leading engineering and design business from India into the Western and Far Eastern worlds, Samir Yagnik is passionate about using Indian-led ERD, which can uh, make innovative products that can make a huge impact not only in India, but the world over. He mixes his understanding of engineering principles with his deep love for music, his empathy and belief in the human spirit across different cultures to think of out-of-the-box applications which can help people and businesses. I'd like to hand the mic over to Mr. Samir Yagnik. Thank you so much. Welcome you to the last session of this wonderful two-day event. I said in the beginning of the conference to a lot of you, that I'd like to dispel the misconception that you're here to just be part of a conference which speaks about engineering research and development and design and engineering. I said, let's replace the word design with creative or create. Let's replace the word engineering with innovation. And of course, uh, you've heard so many different sessions on how to make it happen through reskilling India, reskilling our capability to take us to the next level. Seldom in life do individuals have the kismet, have the wherewithal, have the ability to change the course of fate. You know, we, we make plans and we pretty much dispense wisdom after 20 years, but life takes its course. And we kind of just march along. You know, things come along, we do it, and if they don't, then we change. And we kind of move on. And, and basically, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer that stars determine your future. Partly, of course, your actions. But, but to change that from a certain path and take it 90 degrees away, or 180 degrees away, there are very few special people in the world who have the ability, who have the courage and who have the wherewithal, I would say, and the vision to change the course of fate. Before I introduce the individual, uh, here's a person who has a, who's a package deal, who's created, who has thought through how to contribute to India. Mr. Mohan, uh, Mohan Reddy Garu San said that, you know, India uh, is, where the, is where the opportunity is. Here is a, an individual who grew up in our times, in the 80s, uh, and he thought through how to contribute to where he was growing up. He thought about how to change the education system. So you can think of him, think of him as a reformist, as a show, social reformist, as an innovator, as a creator, as somebody who has scaled skill. Kirti, you are here, scaling skill. And he's everything in one. But before we bring his humble presence to this audience, to this August gathering, I've got to show you an audiovisual of just a glimpse of what this marvelous human being is all about. So hold your hearts, here it comes. <coughs> never let my stay home but here's a school in Ladakh where the most dreaded punishment is to be sent home for two weeks where students learn by doing things where they engage in various innovations to solve real-life problems like climate change where they run the school themselves like a little country with an elected government and learn management and governance that way. Where they learn communication by running the campus newspaper and radio. Science by designing and building their own school, solar heated mud buildings that stay at plus 15 even in minus 15 winters. Kindness and compassion through introspection and meditation. A school where the criteria of admission is not your percentage, but that the conventional system has failed you. Hi, 
I'm Sonam Wangchuk from Ladakh, a remote mountain region in the Indian Himalayas. 25 years ago, when I was finishing my own engineering education, I saw that schools were a pain for everyone, but for mountain children, it was doubly painful and irrelevant. Children who spoke Ladakhi or Tibetan at home were made to sit all day memorizing in alien languages like Urdu or English. F for fan, S for ship, T for train. Till recently, every year, 95% of the students used to fail in the all-important 10th grade exams. Together with like-minded friends, we launched SECMOL, the Students' Educational and Cultural Movement of Ladakh, and said enough is enough. Working with the government, we rewrote many textbooks, retrained the teachers, and organized the villagers. And the results started changing too. For those who still failed, we started the alternative school that you just saw. And the results? Tewang Rigsen went on to become a top journalist and later became the education minister of Ladakh Hill Council at 27. He had failed his 10th grade five times. Stanzin became a filmmaker and has been winning awards across countries. He had failed four times. Miss Tinless is today a celebrated social entrepreneur. She had failed three times. But now we see that the state of higher education is no better. Not only for Ladakhis, who of course are doubly disadvantaged again, but for you in the big cities too. It's time we change this. We in Ladakh are dreaming again. This time our dream is to create an alternative university that will use all our learnings from the past 25 years. Once again, a hands-on doers university where the school of business runs real life companies on campus. The school of tourism runs high-end hotels and simple homestays. The school of education runs innovative schools. The revenues from these sustain the university while the students get free higher education and of course hands-on experience. But this is more than a dream now. His Holiness Chetan Rinpoche, one of the top spiritual leaders in Tibetan Buddhism after His Holiness the Dalai Lama, is supporting this cause as the chief patron. The Hill Council government of Ladakh has earmarked roughly 200 acres of land and the ice tupa artificial glaciers have already started greening this desert. A fully solar heated mud built university township is being planned by some of India's top architects. Together, let's start the next learning revolution where education is not limited to just the three R's, all too much to do with the head alone, where skills of the hands and kindness of the heart are given equal importance. Sure, it would take significant financial resources to materialize this ambitious dream. Recently, I was awarded the prestigious Rolex Award for Enterprise for the Ice Tuba Artificial Glaciers. I contribute my Rolex Award as a seed for this cause. Thank you very much. I have decided to contribute the roughly 1 crore rupees as a seed fund to finally raise 150 crore rupees for the first phase of the project. And I very much hope that you all will join me and match this contribution according to your capacities. Together, we can change the face of higher education forever, not just for Ladakh, but for the whole world. So join us. The future has already begun. And be inspired by Sonam Wangchuk. I'm absolutely honored to be chairing this last <coughs> session, uh, Sonam. We had a wonderful chat earlier on in the afternoon. Um, 
I'm sure the entire audience wants to know you as an individual. Mm -hmm. But to know you as an individual, we need to know your contributions and the little things and the big things that you've done. I want to first start by asking one question about, and maybe you can tell, tell us about your childhood through that question. What is that single emotion that has inspired you, that has driven you to be this wonderful contributor to Ladakh? What is that? Is it anger that things are being done horribly in school? And Thank you. Thank you very much. And greetings to all of you from the mountains of Ladakh. Uh, nice to be with all of you in the warmth of uh, Bangalore. Uh, about uh, what moved me and what moves perhaps most uh, and we talk about today is more than anger, uh, empathy for people who suffer from the lack of a solution or problems that they face. When, when, when you cannot resist you know, doing something about something that's going wrong all uh, over again and again, um, you may momentarily feel anger, but it is uh, much more the empathy to be doing something. And in the mountains, this comes naturally, I think, because people live in very harsh uh, climate and conditions, and you have to be very helpful. You can't survive uh, alone on your own. I sometimes see that in more comfortable places people tend to have less of this yes. but otherwise it is by and large uh, empathy for the seeing from seeing what is going on without a solution and that moves you towards solutions. And your mother was a big, uh, was, was she a yes. socialist, a social reformist or what, what was she? Uh, well, she was again um, uh, a good human being in the mountains, not schooled but highly educated, empathist. very wise and always thinking about others because she has gone through problems when others could rose to the occasion. So, yeah, people are uh, by nature empathetic that way, I think. I see. So in this uh, uh, sick mall, right, mm -hmm. if I'm saying this correctly, mm -hmm. you have taken 75% people who were all failures and have converted them to having successful lives, not necessarily in the traditional sense, but doing meaningful things with their lives. In, in a matter of 10 years, you brought it down to mm -hmm. a very few failures. It was 95% uh, failure ah, and okay. then it came down to 25 or success from 5% wow. only to wow. 75, yes. So okay, so, was? So, so my question was, how was that journey? How did you go about doing that? What, okay. what did okay. you do? Because I think we've all failed in some stage of our life, so let's take that lesson for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Again, it was uh, empathy uh, basically, but uh, it was a great uh, accident that led me towards this problem. I'm so grateful. So in my college days when I was doing mechanical engineering, uh, there were some issues with my father uh, about choosing which stream of engineering and uh, we differed and uh, he said if you do what you do, you'll do it on your own. Mm -hmm. And I, unlike what perhaps he expected to comply, I said thank you very much and went on. And I had to support my own education and to do that I chose to teach okay. uh, students in trouble like the ones I just mentioned. And I did it quite well and it earned for me in two months for all the three years of engineering. It was a great success but more than the financial success, it moved me with empathy. Seeing now with the experience how the system was that was failing these students, 95% of them, while they were so bright, right. so good, when taught the way they learn. Okay, yeah. give us some examples how at that time yeah. you could Yes, yeah, so, so I very soon saw as I started teaching that there was nothing wrong with the students. Normally, teachers and the system would blame the students, you know, uh, you are primitive mountain people, you are almost retarded, they would say. Oh Some would even, uh, you know, devise these pseudo-scientific theories that you people don't have enough oxygen in the air, in the mountains. So you will never do well in maths and science. And this is the 
last thing you can do to a student to make them right. feel it's not in my hands I can't fabricate oxygen so I might as well give up give up yeah so uh, I saw that it was actually none of these I saw that it was actually the system which didn't recognize the client yeah they would bring in Urdu hmm. to, to children speaking only Ladakhi things that are alien totally it doesn't mean anything in the mountains for example uh, urdu and english say um, one example was when i went to a classroom while training teachers they were all memorizing hum apni kheti monsoon ke barish se karte hain oh hmm? hum apna chawal ugate hain and i asked the teacher we don't have monsoon that's why it's a mountain desert and we don't grow rice we grow barley with glacier melt waters and I said to the teacher what if one of these students doesn't write what they are memorizing writes we grow barley with ma uh, glacial melt waters she said wrong wrong answer he'll get zero <laughs> so that's what they were being made to do and he'll be so confused you know in school you grow rice with monsoon and in home you grow barley and they would make them memorize F for fan for God's sake, in minus 20 degrees, fan is the last thing you can associate with. You know? yeah. so, so you can't blame the children. And soon when we, when we actually diagnosed what was wrong, the medium of instruction, the relevance of the curriculum, the training of the teachers, slowly in 7 to 10 years, the percentage went from 5 to 36 to 55 to 75 percent. And that proved a great scientific fact. Now I like to muse that that it was not oxygen in the air. <laughs> so talking about <laughs> oxygen, you built a complete green environment, a solar uh, powered school when it was not in fashion. Nobody's mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. solar. Mm -hmm. Tell us that story. So I have been doing whatever it takes, whatever the environment needs, whether it is a fashion in New Delhi or Mumbai or New York or not, you do what needs doing. You know? Here I was in Ladakh, people were shivering in winter, schools were closing and I saw there was such great sun, 300 days yeah. in a year. Yeah. Only thing our ancestors didn't have was glass, hmm. which is what is a must, otherwise they would have mastered it. Yeah. They had great material like mud, which is insulating, which has mass. All they lacked was glass and glass had come for 100 years now. Yeah, yeah. So I just put together high school science, the chapter on heat that these students were studying, conduction, convection, radiation. Yeah. I put glass in front of walls that are painted black and then the sun would be absorbed, conducted through the wall or air convected around the openings yes. and then at night the walls radiate so you could have plus 15 in a minus. 15 winter so it was natural and therefore we, we, we did it and for a place like this which is so blessed with energy why depend on an oil that comes from Qatar or Iraq you know when you have your your gold is not in ground your gold is in rays coming from above but most of the times we mourn about us not having oil and overlooking what we do have more than anybody else so therefore we went for solar uh, PV panels uh, and passive convectional heating in mid 90s and this school campus that we built for the so-called failures of the system was fully solar heated off grid and zero energy yeah. and these terms were way way not invent coined fantastic yeah. you use the word i did whatever it took yeah now i understand obviously you've been a teacher you've been a guru you've been a teacher trainer but then somewhere in the middle you decided to go back and learn architecture. Mm. Was it because you wanted to build this school or you uh, took a break or how did that happen? No, again, um, I'll come back to it. It was about empathy for people in a cold region in winters, you know. Yeah. Children go to schools that are unheated might be minus five inside, their fingers don't bend and they're expected to write an exam. Yeah. People, when they sleep at night, 
the bedside glass freezes solid by morning. Animals that give milk dry up in winter. It made sense to apply what you know from engineering or science that you study. The science that we study in schools and engineering in colleges and universities, it's not a ritual to get a certificate and then to get a job and then do what your boss tells. It's about <laughs> solving these problems and making life comfortable. Whether it is paying or not in rupees is different. If it pays in satisfaction of people from the you know harshness of the climate sure. it's a huge payment that I value a lot the currency of this uh, you know satisfaction people have so it was for these reasons that sure. I went for solar energy to solve problems yeah. sure so you've done you've been an architect yeah, yeah. yeah you've been an architect you've been a journalist you've also talked about mm -hmm. the dark. <laughs> I want to actually take questions early because when I was talking to Sonam I was inspired by some of the examples that he was taking. I want you all to ask the questions early so he, he can even illustrate with perhaps some examples how uh, his students have, uh, you know, innovated. So can we have the microphone go around and uh, ask uh, people whoever wish to ask questions early about perhaps examples or, you know, what they have done with with uh, the glaciers or whatever. I mean, if you have requests, you can take them. We'll take them early so that he can illustrate. Yeah. The more we can learn, the better it will be for us. Any questions uh, from the audience early? This is a short session. Yeah. If you can state your name, please. Good afternoon. My name is Ramji. Uh, one of the uh, challenges that uh, people face when they want to do something different from the common public is criticism. I'm pretty sure you must have also come across uh, this in your uh, uh, journey. Mm -hmm. How do you handle this? Okay. Uh, well, if you are clever enough, then you expect criticism to come and then you are not like taken by surprise. You know, some people think I'll do social service and everybody will clap and throw flowers at me. It doesn't work like that. Doing good to others is the most complicated thing I've uh, discovered. <laughs> so if you if you expect beforehand that you will be ridiculed, you would be laughed, you would be criticized, you are able to handle better. And actually, criticism is really, really good for you. In fact, in my life, the things that really helped me were people who were very critical, who in their crude ways thought they were thinking bad of me they did the most good to me you know i think in life people who give you problems are not the snakes in snakes and ladder if life was a snakes and ladder game game it's people who just flatter you and give you all the comfort that are the snakes that pull you down people who challenge you people who criticize you push you to think beyond and they actually are the letters at least in my life it has been that way any other questions so often, I ask two questions. often often uh, when there is a challenge being discussed and nobody says it can't be done you're stupid I feel very sad and the moment somebody says this just can't be done and I say good now I'm going to do it come what may <laughs> otherwise it's you know so thanks to them you get many things done. So uh, the gentleman at the back is uh, passionately waving his hands. Yeah uh, so, so can you state your name? Hi my, my name is Shantanu a uh, lot of lot of the things that you, we have seen and you have done Hmm? There are a lot of, lot of the innovations that we have seen from you. A lot of it is common sense, yeah. which is rarely seen though. Uh, but the, my question is, how did you really come across these things? You just gave an example of solar panels built out of glasses. You gave an example of using the melted water for, uh, for, for, for agriculture. So these are really common sense things, but we miss out on these daily common sense things for finding solutions to our problem, and we really look at high-tech solutions. Totally. So how, how did you really come across this thought process? Yeah, beautiful question. Unfortunately, the systems we built, infrastructure like education system, 
uh, were built around say industrial revolution to promote that and therefore killed this common sense uh, you know uh, faculty and makes us just think of problems and solutions or in specialization uh, ways otherwise common sense is what uh, people come up with naturally if education system could give them that faculty strengthen it it may not serve uh, in the short term or in the narrow-minded senses to the industry or to uh, various interests but uh, if people were left to themselves they will come up with commonsensical solutions to things uh, just as like organic food uh, left to nature are very nutritious and good it's it takes a lot of things we do to make them complicated otherwise they are very simple and possible uh, maybe in my case I didn't happen to go to school till nine yeah and that uh, maybe kept my common sense alive <laughs> <laughs> so so I had a similar similar point have you read about design thinking? Yeah, very, very recently, yes. Um, yeah, only think? in the last one or two years, I glimpsed at it. And then I thought, actually, it is commonsensical approach, you know. We just, in our systems that we have in today's society, we first kill everything and then give it as a great dose you know most precious thing design thinking otherwise if you think of all innovations in history evolution of human beings it was like that it didn't have to come from some expert phd or so i'm very impressed by innovations you know way before any of these uh, that we see today for example farming yes farming was a great innovation we used to be hunter gatherers roaming from valley to valley to gather and hunt and then somebody saw that this was a huge problem people had to suffer people had to you know die kill destabilized all the time and also noticed that the seeds of the gathered fruits they ate had grown to fruits again mm -hmm. and then ideated about how this could be controlled yeah. and perhaps collected some seeds while moving upwards and threw it near some water thinking these two combined to give the thing and when they came back after a few months saw that there was a little field and then perhaps with this prototype they tried improving it over years and slowly we had the innovation of farming and people got settled and uh, had an easier life yeah in fact i would say even you know we take for granted innovations of the past like flour that you make uh, roti with atta it is actually outsourcing of the digestive system you know oh. we had to chew every grain of wheat or whatever thousands of time till our jaws hurt and somebody had the empathy to think that i must do something to make it easier okay. so he chewed it in a machine which was the water wheel or whatever chakki it is and chewed it for us and then we now can do more with less energy so these are moved by common sense again i right. mean we don't need to it's good, but we don't need to present it as some great innovation. Brilliant. I, you know, we have five to ten minutes. We can take more questions or we can take some illustrations. I think people want to ask questions, sir. So yeah, maybe sure. we'll have sure. another sure. round sure. with you, sure. Sure. with your illustrations. So we'll sure. take the questions. Let's keep it interactive. Hi, uh, my name is Santil Kumar. And uh, a question for you, how, how did you feel the experience of working with a government agency, even with the health council? Working? Working with a government agency? Yeah. Or uh, you know, the, even yeah. the health council? So were they like your uh, snakes or were they like ladders? <laughs> well, it was uh, the only way you could bring change. It would have much been much easier to do your own private thing as my well-wishers would tell me uh, when I was choosing this they would say of all the things first of all why have you chosen education hmm? you could have done IAS you could have done 
IIM and MBAs and things. Why education? And in education, why government schools? <laughs> why not open a private school? Uh, you know, and, and uh, we'll also send our children. But I didn't see that as a solution. A nation can progress only when whole nation lifts up uniformly. Yeah? And therefore, we went for government, not because it was um, a blessing or a curse or uh, whatever, but because it took that to make people rise up. Because a private school, I feel, is like a little pond. Huh? A pond you can raise by a few meters, but imagine the volume. But government, which is like an ocean, even by a millimeter if you lift it, it will be thousands more in volume. Volumetric gain would be much more. And therefore we chose it. Uh, it was not easy. We knew it was not easy. Therefore we strategized that first we, we had a 10 year intervention with the government. We said first five years, no questions asked. We just keep doing things to make it better for the teachers, better for the bureaucrats and so on and not criticize about why the results are so bad and so on because otherwise it will be a non-starter. So the first five years we did that because our theory was that in any 10 people, uh, two might be always bad. Two might be always good, no matter what the conditions, teachers, doctors, whoever. Six are fence sitters. They can become turned towards the good or the bad. If you take tough measures, then you may lose those six and it will be a majority of eight against two. But if you win them over, it would be the other way. So first five years, we supported them in every way till their, all their you know, excuses and reasons were exhausted. In the second five years, we said, we'll hold you accountable. Now we have done what we can. And in the second five years, we created, for example, media. There wasn't any media in Ladakh. We launched a magazine. We launched a TV program. We launched a radio program. And that's why I was saying I had to become a journalist. I had to become a teacher trainer. I had to become an architect, whatever. We whatever. have that faculty. You know, We human beings can be multiply intelligent, unlike what our schools tend to make us into specialized uh, you know, cogs in a big machine. So, uh, it it was ups and downs and it was expected and therefore, yeah, uh, not at that. Bad. And if I may add, uh, you are scaling this. It's not just ah. one shining example. Yeah, yeah. You want to scale this. So tell us about the scale story. Yes, so about the university you yes. seem to be asking. So when we did that for the government schools, results changed, but we were not going to accept the 25% failure also. Why should a child come out feeling like a failure after spending 10 precious years or 16? So we did a school for the failures, which gave us the confidence that if you do the education in very engaging, practical, you know, using more senses than just memory, uh, you could achieve wonders. And these failures, as you saw in the film, did great things. And moved by this, we are now working on an alternative university where young people in their 20s can do much more, you know, than just listen to lectures and scribble notes. Chalk and talk seems to be what is done in universities. So why not change universities? So that's what we are now working on to bring change in the higher education scenario. Yeah. And again, we are working with the government also because that is the, uh, yeah. Sure, Luke, Luke. Yeah, hello, my name is Luke. Uh, very inspiring, thank you. A uh, question for you is, uh, as you rightly said, innovation have uh, helped us a lot. So you mentioned about fire, you didn't mention, it's our first fire, and then agriculture, and then making flour. And the innovation we're talking today is also quite important that we talk about the last two days, this digitalization, artificial intelligence, and so on. Uh, and this will create a revolution. It will remove a lot of the jobs that we do today. It will need a new system in place, a new way we organize society, most probably. So what is your take on that? What do you think is the society of the future based on your experience in the mountain? And then through this beautiful... Based on? Based on your experience going through that, what yeah. do you think is the society of the future uh, coming yeah. from these transformation? As you rightly said, the robots will replace this way of thinking in a scientific fashion only in one direction will force us to be more vertical, uh, more horizontal. 
So how the society will organize around that? Generally speaking, I'm not so impressed with the so-called modernization that's happening, that's making us, you know, deviate away from how we have evolved as human beings, you know, from primates to homo sapiens and so on. And anything that gives us this so-called comfortable life with economic this and that um, does not impress me. I actually think life could be so much simpler and healthier perhaps the way people used to be with certain uh, extreme uh, difficulties removed so anything that speeds up that modernization I have a big question mark so if if you are not sure where you are going slower you go the better is what I feel <laughs> So I'm not really sure. This will speed up. This will definitely speed up. But I'm not sure about the goal itself. So the faster may not be the better. You know, time is limited. It feels like all like the sun is coming out and we are thinking again about the obvious things. But I'd like you to, Sonam, maybe say a few things to leave behind to our audience about when they go back on, you know, Monday, uh, what should they do differently or whatever that the mm -hmm. thoughts that come to you mm -hmm. to leave behind for the audience. I have a few takeaways which I will summarize but first sir. Generally I would say in life or in your jobs uh, I feel personally that the currency of uh, your income or your uh, accruing wealth should be more the the impact you can bring to people's lives, the solutions that you can provide to people more than the currency of rupees and gold and silver and things. So think about the people who finally will be affected. Will they be trapped into a system that will harm them or will they be liberated and be happier on their own? Your work, whether it contributes towards holistic happiness of people or does it make them dependent, make them, you know, less happy and uh, more depressed and down along the line. So think about your own fields and act accordingly and it's never too late to act uh, and do things differently is what I would say. Brilliant. I want to, I want to Profusely and from the bottom of my heart, and I know all of NASCOM wants to thank Sonam, but I've got a couple of three takeaways that I'd say. Uh, maybe you have picked up the same lessons, maybe you haven't. First thing that I picked up is simplify. Simplify everything rather than complicated. Simplify and maybe the answer lies in the common sense. Uh, two is, you know, think about what, who it touches, whether it touches human lives or not. Or is it just, you know, whatever you're trying to do, is it going to help someone or is it just going to make money for you? Of course, a lot of us go through Maslow's need hierarchy, do what we had to do and then dispense Gyan and, and do whatever they have to do. Well, sometimes uh, your life pressures will take you that way. But most important lesson for me is, here we have somebody who's a child, when I was just talking to him before that. And I said to you guys, you can't grow old. If you're growing old, you don't be in this conference. And he used a statement, and maybe you want to say that, is never stop questioning, never stop, uh, never stop, uh, never stop growing up. And uh, maybe you yeah, want to say one of our that. friends on the table was thinking this is too late, and I, I said uh, it starts whenever you think it uh, should. Jab jage tabi savera, as they say. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. From all of us at NASCOM and everybody here, we love you. Thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. You're very inspiring. Thank you. Thanks. It's been indeed an honor and a privilege to have uh, Sir Wang Chuk here with us. I'd like to request you to please stay back for just a moment. Oh. I'd like to request uh, Samir to present a small token of our appreciation. We do these things. To uh, okay. Sir Wang Chuk. Nature. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a big round of applause. Wonderful. It's been. Thank you. A very plant. inspiring session it's and it's a plant. It's a plant and it will grow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And on behalf of uh, NASCOM, we'd also like to present a small token of our appreciation to Sameer. Oh, okay. Also a plant? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Come, come. I'm supposed to get this done. That's good. Yeah, sorry. Is it for me? Or is it for him? <laughs> but, but you can have it. Sorry, it's for you. <laughs>